Right, hi, I am Don Ritter. Uh, I'm the veterinarian with Mount Air Farms. Um, I'm also chairman of the Poultry Health Committee for DPI, and, and I've, I've done that a while. Um, I've been a production vet on Delmarva for 31 years, and I'm happy to say that we've had bird flu one of those years. So it's not a common thing, but it can happen, okay? Uh, so what I'm gonna talk to you tonight about is uh, our response plan and how that impacts you as a grower if flu should be unfortunate enough to be on, on your farm, okay? So we're talking about Delmarva, and Delmarva is a unique place. Um, there's five chicken companies doing business here. And our field inventory is about 110 million birds. And that's about 10% of all the chickens raised in the country are raised on the shore. Uh, it's the most dense broiler chicken growing area in the U.S., meaning more chickens per square mile than anywhere else. Uh, and we're fortunate that we're mostly a broiler monoculture, meaning that we don't have a lot of long-lived birds mixed into where the broilers are grown. Like we don't have egg layer farms right in the middle of us or turkey farms. And so short-lived birds kind of gives us less risk of disease introduction, okay? So we don't have to keep a site uh, biosecure for 50 weeks, okay? It's for eight weeks at a time. So that's an advantage. But our density is definitely a disadvantage. All broilers is an advantage. All right, this is a view out the airplane coming into Salisbury. And you see several farms that are close, to, close together here. And, you know, being close to a disease is one risk of disease, right? right? Proximity is one risk of catching something sitting next to the guy who has Ebola on the airplane is a risk. And, you know, also uh, connections to a farm are even more of a risk sometimes. So I would suspect that in, 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 these, in this picture that there's some connections between these farms. You know, this guy here may be the son of this guy. And they may go back and forth all the time. So in your head, you, you think, if this is a diseased farm, that this guy is, is at risk, but the disease could already have leapfrogged over to this farm, okay? So it's, it's being close to somebody who has disease or being connected to that farm. And those connections can be 50 miles away, okay? So it's not always about being close to something. Uh, here's, a, here's a map of a farm circle on the shore. And when we're talking about high, uh, about high path flu, uh, uh, we draw a control zone around a positive farm. And, and that control zone for high path flu is 12.4 miles wide. So this circle is 12.4 mile diameter. And that takes up a lot of area. So in, in this particular circle, there's 162 farms, 500 houses, and 12 and a half million birds, okay? So one case can affect a lot of people because there's gonna be restrictions inside this circle, okay? All right, I wanna go back in time a little bit and talk about the year we did have flu on Delmarva, and that was in 2004. That's 11 years ago now. Um, and what happened then is, is we had a, an independent grower uh, bought an old chicken farm and started raising uh, birds with colored feathers, like brown feathers, black feathers, and things, and was, and was selling those birds up in the live bird markets in New York City and New Jersey. And he brought back coops that were dirty, got infected, and infected his flock with flu. Birds started dying, he took them to the lab, we found out they had flu, and we depopulated his farm. We set up one of these circles, tested everybody, and we found the infection on a flock seven miles away that happened to be under contract with Purdue. And then a month later, Mount Air had a flock 60 miles away. Um, and so what we really had was two introductions of this flu virus from the live bird markets in the winter of 2004. Okay, the virus wasn't living on somebody's shoe for a month. 
okay? We, we had two separate introductions of virus onto commercial farms. And we found these farms from elevated mortality testing, okay? The mortality went up, took them to the lab, tested them for flu, and they lit up positive. And, and so we found them right away. We, we depopulated both farms in 48 hours after detection. Uh, the Mount Air Grower operated two nearby farms with all the same people, took all his dead birds to one dead bird disposal site. So he was operating one biosecurity system. And so we killed the birds on all three farms, okay? Um, and so it was contained and did not spread either time. And this was about a $2 million cost just of two farms, okay? Uh, so the take home message is that, that we contained it really not once but twice from spreading in a real dense poultry area. And so we have a history of success with flu on the shore. Okay, there's not many dense areas of the country that have kind of a one and done with bird flu. Okay, but we are one of those places. All right, so what did we learn this year and what happened this year that made a difference? And, you know, Dr. Shapiro's already talked about a lot of those things, and I've added my, my list, but, but I do think some major mistakes were made once the virus got into dense poultry regions of the Midwest. And the first thing that, that was a mistake was failure to identify and test high mortality flocks in a timely manner. Okay, the first farm in Minnesota of turkeys that had bird flu the grower didn't call a serviceman to test his birds until he was losing a thousand turkeys a day. Okay? So during that time, his farm is infectious to other farms, and there's an incubation period with any disease, and that's the time that the bird's infected before they show symptoms. So that's five to eight days. So he was positive probably for a week to two weeks before they even got tested. A lot of farm traffic on and off in two weeks, right? And so that's just a big risk. So, so we need your help. It's very important that when you have elevated mortality that you call your flock supervisor. We'll either get birds to the lab or we'll get swabs from the birds to test for flu, okay? But all sick chickens need to get tested for flu. And, you know, basically you just assume they have flu until you test them, okay? It's that serious that we need to test these birds fast. Um, then what happened was they were unable to depopulate the positive flocks in a timely manner, okay? The first farm in Minnesota, turkey farm again, was, it took them eight days to depopulate the farm. So they had, a, they had the incubation period, they had the time when they were dying before they got tested, and then you had another week when they were still out there. So, the, so this one site was a virus factory for a, about three weeks. And that leads to spread, especially in a densely populated area. And then they failed to biocontain the, the infection on positive sites. Uh, uh, again, if you leave a, a, a big turkey farm virus positive for three weeks, there, there's too much traffic on and off. Okay, you're just not going to be able to keep it on in one place. Um, and those mistakes lead to windborne spread of flu because it's blowing out the tunnel fans all the time. Every day you're waiting. And that's a risk of blowing to the next farm depending on how close they are. Okay? So I think everybody lear has learned that these are things that, 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 that can't happen again. And uh, the states that, that maybe were, were underprepared or kind of prepared to, 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 to do the right thing now. On the shore, we're not going to let any of these things happen. So the goal of our response planning, the first goal is to keep it out. Okay? Don't let it in our broiler farms. If it doesn't get in the broiler farms, we don't have a meeting like this. Okay? The, the second thing is, if AI does get into a farm on the shore, is we're prepared to get rid of it fast. Okay, and get back to business as usual for everybody. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. 
Uh, there's been a lot of good biosecurity uh, I ideas presented tonight. And there's lists, there, there's lists that the, the companies have sent out. Uh, there's lists on, on websites, uh, DPI has them, Georgia has them. Every list or article about biosecurity has good information in it, okay? It's not a beat your chest thing that, well, ours is harder than theirs, and they forgot about this, and what about that? Look, all these steps that, that, we, that have been talked about reduce the risk of disease entering your farm. So they're all good, okay? So the things that I've highlighted on a list that we sent out to growers was we, we really want people to wear dedicated footwear, okay? We don't want you to wear the shoes you wore to the golf course stepping in goose poop. We don't want you to wear the shoes that you wore to the fishing hole around the pond where the ducks are, back to your chicken house. OK, we want you to be smart about where your feet have have been because manure and droppings are the way it's going to get into your house. Um, we really don't want chicken growers to have contact with waterfowl. This is the way the first case will get bird flu on Delmarva is from contact with waterfowl. This isn't the winter to go hunting. Take the season off. If, it's, if it was my family farm and my livelihood, that's too big a risk. Okay? They have the virus. You don't. Don't have contact with them. That's really what, what we want to happen. We really need your help in reporting elevated mortality immediately to your flock supervisor so we can get the birds tested for flu. Okay? We know the test is likely to be negative. It's been negative for 11 years, since 2004. We test sick flocks all the time for flu. But this winter especially, we need to be right on top of this. And then the last thing is, and, and, and I think this has been talked about uh, already, is that you know your farm is your farm. And, and you're responsible for everybody that goes in that chicken house. So for you to do the right thing is, is, is great, but if, if your hired help that picks up your dead birds on the weekend just came from going duck hunting, then that's not good. So you've got to educate your workers. Anybody that goes inside where those birds are has to observe these biosecurity guidelines to protect your, your flock. Okay, so what happens if it does get in a farm and we find flu on a farm? What's our response? What's going to happen to you? And, and how's it going to go? So that's what we're going to talk about now. We have one goal, and the goal is to make this problem go away as fast as possible and get back to business as usual. Okay? And we're committed to doing that, very committed, and I'll show you how. Uh, uh, there's four priorities in an AI response. Uh, they've always been the same. They'll always be the same. The first priority is human health, that we're not going to put people at risk of, of getting bird flu. So if we put people inside a house that have infected birds, they'll be wearing the personal protective equipment necessary to make sure they don't get infected. All right? The next thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the diseased birds. And we're going to get rid of them in less than 24 hours to prevent spread to the next farm. Third thing we're going to do, we're going to do it as humanely as possible, that we're going to kill the animals as humanely as possible using a method that will meet that 12 to 24 hour deadline. Okay? And then the third thing we're going to do, or the fourth thing rather, is we're going to keep operating your poultry farms, keep operating our plants, keep operating our feed mills, and have some business continuity while we are responding to an event. But we're going to do it safely. All right. The human health piece I've already talked about. We're going to put the fewest number of people in a house that has sick poultry. Uh, we're going to follow the Center for Disease Control guidelines for human exposure to bird flu. 
And we've partnered with public health officers in all of our counties to help us do that. For example, uh, after workers work in a, in a positive house, they're monitored for two weeks for, for, for fever. And if they spike a fever, then they get tested for flu and to see if they possibly got bird flu, okay? So the, we're gonna protect the workers while they're in the house, we're gonna monitor them afterwards, okay? Um, disease er eradication is we need to empty an area of poultry as soon as we can. And how we do that is three or four different ways is we're gonna depop the positive farms, we're gonna test and move birds to slaughter. So we may change growing programs. So on that picture I showed you from the airplane, if one of those farms has flu, and we've got a, a roaster farm nearby, but he's only six weeks old, we'll take those birds out at six weeks and process them instead of leaving them out there for two more weeks to see if they get sick, okay? If we can test them negative and get them out of harm's way, on a shackle, then we'll, we'll, we're gonna empty that area of poultry. Uh, absence of host is the best disease control method, okay? No, no, no chickens, no bird flu. And we're, and we're not gonna put chicks back right next door to an AI positive farm, okay? So it, it, if a farm's positive and, a, and the farm across the street is supposed to get chicks on Monday, we're not putting chicks in there until that area is safe. And this will be a response led by the industry. We will use the best approved depopulation method to meet the time frame required. Uh, it could be water-based foam, it could be CO2 gas, and, and it could also be ventilation shutdown. Okay, but we're gonna meet a 12 to 24 hour deadline. And then we're gonna keep operating our farms. All right, so, so who are the stakeholders in a response? You're the top stakeholder, okay? Broiler contract growers, this is your business, okay? If you don't have chickens in your houses, you're not making money. If we don't have chickens in our process and plant, we're not making money. So we gotta to work together and not end up being Jenny O and, and cut off a night shift, okay? Uh, the poultry industry, obviously, ag, the labs, uh, state and federal government, all of us are stakeholders. The federal government's a, about a billion dollar stakeholder uh, in 2015. But it comes down to risk management, okay? The, the, the risk of overreaction is small. Okay, if we don't put chicks in, in that farm for 30 days, the risk is small, okay? If we do put chicks on that farm and they get sick and spread it to the next farm and he spreads it to the next farm, then that's the wrong decision, okay? So we're likely to, to, to overreact instead of underreact. Because of our density, we just only get one swing at the ball, okay? If we make some wrong decisions and this thing gets out of hand and it starts snowballing, then we turn into the Midwest. So the structure that we use is uh, our response plan follows the incident command structure or ICS and a, a lot of fire companies use this, uh, FEMA uses it, emergency management uses it. And it basically assigns roles to everybody to avoid duplication. It, it's an efficient response system. And everybody has a, a, a role and it all flows together. Uh, the incident commander is gonna be the state veterinarian. And there's two major components of our plan. And, and in both Maryland and Delaware, Dr. Shapiro and myself are, are, are in some boxes on the structure. So, so, so we'll be directly involved in the response here. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is the state vet at the, at the top of the chart. And we've got a planning section, which is I'll be uh, working in, and, and an operations section that Dr. Shapiro will be leading. We have a logistics section and a finance section. But all these boxes are important uh, and 
and uh, are, are going to be done to make the response go. So if we find AI in a commercial poultry farm, the first thing we need to know is what do we have to, to deal with? You know, can we see all of the problem? Or has it been lingering for three weeks on a farm before we get called? And has it already spread to a bunch of other farms that are now going to start dying because the incubation period's over and now they start showing up? And then we talk about the three D's. So this is what happens on a farm. So the three D's are pretty simple. First one is depopulation, where we uh, kill the birds. And we're going to do that in 12 to 24 hours. The second one is disposal. Now that they're dead, we need to get rid of the bodies. Okay? And we're, we're, and we're, and we're going to get rid of the, of the bodies by composting them inside the, the chicken house. We don't want to take infectious material outside where the wind blows it to the next guy. We want to work inside the building. We want to compost the feed, the litter, the manure shed uh, litter, uh, the dead bird compost that's outside that has AI birds in it. All that stuff has to be brought inside and composted. Okay? I don't think anybody in, in, in here wants feed picked up from the AI positive farm brought to their farm. Okay? So, so we're not going to move any feed off of this farm, obviously. So that's disposal. So depopulation, disposal, and then after we move this compost material outside of the house, we're going to decontaminate the house. We're going to C&D the house and clean that farm more than it's ever been cleaned before and get it ready for new chicks. Okay. So those are the three D's, depopulation, disposal, and decontamination. And how fast is necessary? 24 hours maximum for high path flu. Okay, we are not going to fool around with high path flu. And the 24 hour timeline is for us to find and depopulate all of the AI infected flocks. So that's our goal. So if something happens on the shore, there will be people at your farm at night if, if, if you're in a control zone collecting swabs, uh, checking on mortality, washing vehicles, okay? There's, there, there, it'll be a 24-7 response to meet this timeline. Uh, teams are going to work together. Again, timelines be very aggressive. Uh, uh, normal work as we know it is going to kind of stop and we really don't care the time of day or what day of the week it is. Everybody in the response is committed to getting the job done in 12 to 24 hours. Okay. Uh, the respective section leaders are going to work with multi-company personnel to get all this done. You know, AI is not a go it alone disease. It's not a, oh, Tyson has a problem in Virginia. You know, woe is them. Or, oh, poor Purdue's got a farm over in Harrington now. You know, it's, it's a Delmarva problem. It's all of us together working to get rid of it. Okay. Um, here's some photos from 2004 that kind of show the process. And I thought this would be the easiest way to talk about it. You know, obviously you need a lot of supplies when you're fighting AI. We've got masks here, coveralls, uh, sprayers, tubes. Uh, a lot of supplies are, are being gone through. Uh, the positive farm is quarantined by the state. Uh, we stop litter movement. You know, we test all farms about seven days before processing for flu now. But if we know high path flu is on the shore, then I don't trust a test from a week ago because they could have been infected and be in that uh, incubation period now. So we're going to move that, that pre-slaughter sampling up to either 24 or 48 hours before live haul gets there. Because the worst thing that we can do is move a positive farm down the road on 25 live haul trucks with feathers blowing off all along the way. Okay? So we are not going to move any farm that hasn't been tested right, like right now for flu once we identify flu is in the area. 
because you know like the positive farm may have had a contact all the way down in Virginia okay so you say well you know why do we got to kind of retest the guy in Virginia because we don't know so we're gonna retest everybody okay we're gonna make sure because we cannot move this down the road okay we're gonna provide security for the positive farm we don't want any any uh, people out there uh, we're gonna provide uh, uh, this is the Mount Air farm this is the co2 truck delivering gas back in 2004 um, and when he turns around and comes out this guy's going to wash that truck from from stem to stern and he'll drive off that that farm clean okay so we're not going to spread anything because we bring a vehicle onto a positive farm and and uh, we're not going to take 20 cars to a positive farm okay all the workers will meet at a staging area we'll, we'll go through the instructions with them um, we'll bring them to the side in a van give them their PPE do our work uh, we'll have a veterinarian on on site to make sure things things go as humanely as possible and this is a sad picture but this is what it looked like in Pocomoke in 2004 uh, 470,000 birds were depopulated now we're going to use this water-based foam uh, or ventilation shutdown then okay so now we have workers on this farm and we, and we got to get them off clean so we tell them to wear their oldest clothes or go to Walmart and buy a $20 sweatsuit because they're donating those clothes and shoes okay they're not taking them off the farm so they're gonna work all day they're gonna get contaminated and we don't want them we don't want any of that going anywhere else so we clean them up we put them through this uh, shower unit and we send them home in a nice new pair of coveralls and plastic boots and and he is barefoot we do take their shoes too and we put them back in the white van send them home clean safe and we test the farm for quarantine release make sure that we've killed all the virus on the farm and AI affects a lot of things in a community. You know, here's a consignment auction that, that was canceled uh, due to flu. All right, I want to talk about indemnity now and then grower impacts, okay? So indemnity, the word means compensation for loss or a, or a taking, okay? Um, and the economic reason for paying indemnity for disease is to encourage surveillance and reporting to prevent spread to other sites, okay? So high indemnity payments encourages people to look for a disease and to report. And low indemnity payments encourages people to not report and to kind of go underground, okay? We are blessed in the US that we, that uh, indemnity is paid by the federal government for high path flu. And kind of what is covered is the bird value of the birds depopulated, the 3D cost, and we talked about the three Ds, uh, depopulation, disposal, and decontamination, and then the cost of surveillance. I mean, the lab is burning through a lot of supplies doing all these tests for us, and they get reimbursed for, for some of that. So what's not covered by indemnity? Uh, litter, security, extended downtime for contract growers, unemployed poultry company workers, loss of market, loss of income. So the market for poultry companies, I think Dr. Shapiro mentioned it, but uh, leg quarters or dark meat is, is what we usually export. Uh, before AI hit, leg quarters were trading at about 40 cents a pound in the export market and uh, even though no broiler farm was infected by flu we lost our trading partners that cut off the whole country the current price of leg quarters is 18 cents a pound and several companies are in a lost situation now because the value of the back half of the bird basically got cut in half 
or less than half. Okay? So we've taken a hit, even though we weren't involved with flu. All right, the cost of the burr is about, say, $3 right, right now. The, the 3D costs are kind of similar. So an average farm of 60000 is going to be three dollars to $400,000 is what indemnity would cost. In the, in the current federal indemnity rules, current indemnity is paying about 70% of, of the actual losses. And by rule, it can only be paid to the owner of the birds. And the owner of the birds is the integrator or the poultry company. And then the poultry companies need to pass through the grower labor pay from that indemnity. Uh, it helps the industry survive an emergency disease outbreak. But changes to, to the indemnity are being considered strongly. Uh, I was on a conference call yesterday, and I think this is coming forward, moving forward. And I think it'll, be, it'll move forward by the end of the year, which is why I'm sharing it uh, with you. But these are, are proposes, okay, or proposed changes. And one is that the federal government wants to ensure that adequate biosecurity practices are being followed on commercial poultry farms, okay? And the second thing is, is they wanna make sure that integrators share indemnity with growers and pay them for the labor raising the depopulated flock, okay? So what that means well, first of all, uh, these changes require a federal rulemaking, and, and that should be published before the end of the year. So here's the changes. The first one is that the federal government is, doesn't want to pay money when biosecurity has not been followed. Okay? So affected growers will be required to sign a statement that confirming that they had a biosecurity program in, in place and it was being followed before flu was found on their farm. So that's the first thing that's going to have to happen. You're going to have to have a biosecurity program in place to be eligible for indemnity. And number two is payment for the grower labor to grow the birds to the point of depopulation Instead of being paid to the owner of the bird, it'll be paid to the contract grower, okay? Now, the amount paid for the labor will be reduced by any grower payment paid by the integrator per our contract. And I'm gonna go through an example for you. And then the balance will be paid to the integrator as is the current practice. So what would this look like Oh, okay, first of all, okay, so, so, so the goal of these changes is to ensure that biosecurity is, is being practiced on commercial poultry farms and also to ensure that growers are compensated for, for the labor in raising the birds until the age of depopulation. So here's an example that I wrote up. To, to go over, and I want to take a, a, a few minutes to, to make sure that this is clear. So, so uh, I have a fictitious farm that raises 75,000 eight-week-old birds, and at the end of the flock, his average grower pay is $30,000. Okay, so we're going to start there. So that's an average grower payment at the end of eight weeks. And his farm becomes infected, and the birds are depopulated at six weeks of age. Okay, so we take them out at six weeks. So the growers worked for six weeks, right? Taking care of the birds all the way from zero to six weeks. So the proportional grower payment due would be six eighths, which is three fourths or 75% of the 30,000 that you would have got if you worked for eight weeks. So the, 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 so the payment due at the age the birds are depopped is 22,500. 
And, and I just use Mount Air's disaster peg because we think high path flu qualifies for our disaster clause. And that pays $15 per thousand capacity per week of age. So you got $15 times 75 thousands times six weeks is 6750. So the 225 minus what we paid you means the government would write you a check for 15,750 and and pay you directly instead of paying Mount Air and then Mount Air has to reimburse you. Okay? So in the end, uh, you know, you would be paid for the six, <coughs> for the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for the six weeks of labor that you did to raise those birds. Okay. So these changes are coming and that's if you have a biosecurity plan in place. All right, there's other grower impacts. First of all, growers assume disease risk you know, all people who raise animals for a living assume disease risk for normal diseases, okay? Chickens get certain things. They get laryngotracheitis once in a while. Uh, they get coccidiosis. They get air sac. And the, and the chicken companies and the veterinarians and, and staff are, work hard to try to minimize the effects of normal diseases. And we're working all the time trying to get better vaccines, better ways to apply them. Uh, and that's part of normal animal agriculture. But, but growers depend on the company, the state, and federal partners to protect them from foreign animal diseases like bird flu, okay? And we realize that, and, and, and we take this charge very seriously. So I want to talk about infected and in the wrong place, wrong, wrong time farms. So I've already talked about this some, but just to review it one more time, once we find flu, we'll ask you to set your poultry houses to a minimum ventilation setting so we don't blow a whole lot of air out of that house. And then our strike team's basically going to come in, kill the chickens, compost them in the house, Take them outside, cover them up, clean your farm up, and get it ready for new chicks. And all that work is going to be done for you. Okay? And our goal is to get this farm ready for repopulation as soon as possible. Because we've got to do all those things before the quarantine will be lifted. So we're doing all that to get out of quarantine. So what are wrong place, wrong time farms? We've already talked about them a little bit in that, you know, being close to AI is a risk. And then being in this, in, you know, being in a control zone has some limitations. But basically, if, if this farm has flu and this farm is supposed to get chicks three days from now, we're not putting chicks there, okay? That's too risky. So this grower, when he doesn't have birds, is not making money. You know, he's gonna lose maybe a half a flock of chickens. So he may have another 30-day layout, of, of extended layout. He didn't do anything wrong. He's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So what, what you do uh, affects you, and it also affects your neighbor. And what your neighbor does can affect you. We're all in this together. Um, and, and there's always a line in a quarantine event. Uh, we had it in, in 04 that we had a, a, a no chick placement line, but the guy across the street was getting chicks. But this farm wasn't. But there's always a line somewhere okay really what we need for animals is we need a program where like there is for for crops where you have some insurance for for drought or for a hurricane damage and we need business interruption and in insurance for emergency diseases 
and the government's looking at this, some way to put this together, but it's not going to be tomorrow. Okay, but they realize it's not just poultry. Okay, pigs have their diseases, cattle have their diseases, and anybody can have business interruption due to disease. And right now, there's no insurance for that. So recovery, uh, how long until we can get back in production? Because that's what you need to be back in production to make money. It's what we need to be back in production to make money. And basically, we can go through all these, but if you add them together, it's going to take about 90 days to get you back in chickens. It's about three months. Now, the government's added this three-week empty time after we do everything. I'm sorry, it's place new litter in houses. Forget the delivered chicks. I can't deliver chicks until after this time. So I got to take that, I, like that's a typo. Um, so basically a positive farmer is going to be out of birds about three months. So some contract growers will temporarily lose their jobs. And the longer the event goes on, the longer that will be. In one county in Minnesota, they had 47 circles. They kept popping every week. And, and they couldn't put turkeys anywhere because there was infection everywhere. Everybody was down for about six months. That's not what we're going to let happen here. Okay? Uh, on the shore, you see how fast it adds up. We have 110 million chickens. Here's the cost of if we depopulate one or five or 25 or 75 percent. And I want to point out this 25 percent depopulated. You know, Holland has about 100 million broilers. They're very similar to us, very concentrated in where they grow them. And in 2003, they let High Path get out of hand. And they ended up killing 25 percent of their farms to finally eradicate it. That would be 25 million chickens on the shore. And the top two broiler companies went bankrupt in Holland. Okay? So if two of the five companies on the shore go bankrupt because of a failed AI response, then that's bad for everybody. So we don't want that to happen here. So the good news is we want to be Arkansas and not Minnesota. And what I mean by that is Arkansas had a one and done. They had a meat turkey farm uh, start dying, tested them right away, depopulated them the, the next day, never spread. Eight weeks later, they're back to normal operations. Okay? Missouri had two. And Minnesota and Iowa had 200. Okay, that's where things got out of hand. Anything can be done. Uh, we did it in 2004 when we were less prepared. We've been working on it together for 11 years since then to increase our response capabilities. I think we can do it again. We'll learn from the, mid, the Midwest to make our, our plan stronger. And I can proudly say that we lead the nation in our preparedness for flu. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's in 2004, our uh, experience then, plus the density of the shore, requires us to be ready at, at, at all times. And so we'll protect our industry from flu with help from everybody. And what you do matters. And, and, and I... And I look forward to partnering with you to prevent this disease from getting on your farms. And if it would enter your farm, to help get rid of it as soon as we can and get back to business. And I thank you.